Hello everyone, welcome to another video and in this one I want to show you how you can use your S232's built-in real-time clock to keep accurate time and to trigger some really accurate events. The real-time clock is a peripheral that is used for lots of computing devices just to keep time as accurately as possible without the uh, presence of internet. So it comes in a variety of packages and recently more and more vendors have integrated it inside of the microcontroller, but you can still find lots of modules uh, to keep them a separate device. As always, I'm gonna be using the F4 Discovery Bolt, which does not have populated the external crystal oscillator for the real-time clock peripheral, but we're gonna be using the integrated one inside the IC, which is gonna be more than enough for the demonstration. The core idea of the real-time clock is a simple device with an oscillator and a network or series dividers and registers to provide us with a 1Hz pulse. As it turns out, for most applications, one second precision is more than enough, and it solves lots of problems with having greater precision, such as larger registers for holding greater data. With that said, that one second pulse has to be very accurate. So one second accurate, uh, reference is then used to increment various counters for said seconds, minutes, hours, days, months and years. We can use relations between these intervals to calculate current time and date, where let's say 1 minute is 60 seconds and 1 hour is 3600 seconds and 1 day is 86400 seconds and so on. So we can use that 1 second as a basis for all other measurements. For a simple off top of the head counter implementation would be to have just a large counter of seconds which could be incremented by one by our second reference. Because we know relations between seconds and other time units, we can convert them easily. The idea behind that is the Unix timestamp, which just utilizes the one hertz incrementation for every day since the midnight of the 1st of the January 1970. And this method is used to keep time in computers everywhere. It only recognizes one day as having 86,400 seconds, therefore it doesn't uh, include the leap seconds and leap minutes, which are uh, implemented in later. So this method is not implemented in ST32 peripheral. We can see that with the 32-bit register, the maximum number of years stored as using a Unix timestamp is around 136 years, or to the year 2106. So even though this is still far away, this is, means that it's really not scalable for simple microcontrollers, so we want to make things scalable. This next bit is not really related to our topic, but it is on timekeeping. A few years ago, I built this project over the summer, which is a simple Nixie clock uh, with integrated clock source. So over here, I have a clock oscillator. I have a series divider to provide me with a one minute pulse over here and one second pulse on the LED over here. So I can see that it's working. This one minute pulse is incrementing the first timer over here which drives the first Nixie clock to display numbers from 0 to 9. When this one overflows, it resets itself and increments the next one, which increments the tenths of minutes. When this one overflows with number 5, so 59 uh, minutes, this one resets itself and increments the ones of the hour. So this is the ones of the hour and the tenths of the hour. And when we get the magical combination of 24 hour, this end gate over here resets both of them and this is very nice and it works and I have a few buttons to forcibly increment hours and minutes and it runs on the supercapacitor if the power is disconnected or turns off completely. I have to keep working on the DC to DC converter which just fried on itself but I'm going to be showing this in a later video. But as you can see, this is nothing but a series of dividers from old technology, like this is CD series 4000. So this is really old and really simple. But in the microcontrollers, when we want to control like leap seconds, leap years, leap days, we want to implement it a little bit different. In S32, this is implemented in the form of several BCD or binary coded decimal counters inside of time and date register. BCD is used to represent numbers the way we see them in decimal, so one digit per magnitude, so ones, tens, hundreds and thousands, so on, but in binary. So we can see that we can represent uh, one digit from 0 to 9, we need 4 bits. 
but uh, for different numbers we can uh, have different width of bits. Let me show you what I mean. So for the date register we have date once, oh let me give a proper blue color, date once and date tens. Our date can go from 0 to 30 or 31 or even for February 28. So all this different functionality is implemented by the peripheral itself. But in contrast, the maximum amount of days we have 0 to 31. So for 30s over here, the maximum number in binary of 3 is 1, 1. So 3. So we need only 2 bins for 10s. And the maximum number for 1s is 9. As we can see, we're going to go from 0 to 9 then 10, 20, 30, and so on. So 9 in binary is 1, 0, 0, 1. So we need 4 bits for that. Similar for seconds, we can see the seconds go from 0 to 59 or 60. So for 9 as well, we need 1, 0, 0, 1. And for 5, we need 1, 0, 1. So we need only 3 bits. And this is how everything is done. So this is seconds, minutes, hours, and we have days, months, and years. Years are a little bit different. Years are only the tens and ones, so this is the year from 0 to 99. So we need to remember in code somewhere which is our base year. So if our base year is let's say 2000, we're gonna have years from 2000 to 2099. And then we need to have for the next uh, century, we're gonna have a base year of 2100 and then 2100 to 2199. Do not be disturbed by the BCD format, no problem, the HAL has implementation built in to transform this binary code decimal back into the binary, which we can then later use in a normal variable and to just transform it into a regular string with the standard library functions. So a little bit about the clock. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we want to have our one second pulse as accurately as we can. This, however, is not the only condition that we have. We also have in the real world power requirements. Because real-time function is so desirable in most computing devices and watches for this matter, we want to have the peripheral to draw as little power as possible. So not only in device operation mode but all as sleep as well. We can disable most internal microcontroller peripherals but you have to keep the real-time clock running. The first optimization is the actual frequency of the real-time clock. You have seen this crystal numerous times on motherboards, phones, on these real-time clock modules, and even in the clocks. This crystal is so large and in specific shape because it's the specific crystal for the frequency of 32, let me get a better color, of 32,768 Hz. Why this number? So in metrology, we often use 10 megahertz as a standard frequency for metrology and measurement and uh, reliability. This is because to a few reasons. So low frequency circuits draw less power than the high frequency circuits. Because in low frequency circuits you have less power dissipation on transistors, you have less losses and your circuit uh, performs more efficiently. Uh, think about your computer and all the channels that deal with overclocking. When they increase the clock speed of the processor, the energy demand of the processor increases and it gets hotter, which is a nice indication that it draws a lot more power. So that's why we want to have a low frequency instead of a high one. That's why we often have a dedicated crystal to provide us with this frequency over here. And it's a dedicated crystal as well because we want to have a separate crystal which is made with tight tolerances in order to be as precise as possible which is one of our goals as well. Also because there are millions of watches using real-time clock these crystals of this specific frequency are dirt dirt cheap and much more cheaper like tens and hundred times cheaper than your average let's say 8 megahertz crystal for your processor. That's why we use this one. The next reason is due to simply implementation. This weird number of 32,768 is actually 2 to the power of 15. And we love 2 to the power of something because in digital domain we can easily divide this number down by just dividing it by 2, 2, 2. So in this case we need to divide this number or this frequency 15 times by 2 to get the resulting 1 hertz. And this is very easy. 
For example, here is the CD4060, which is a very old uh, counter IC. It just has the clock over here on the input. Oh, come on. Over here is the clock and it has multiple dividers one by one in a series. So we start with the divide by 60 and then we divide by 2 to get 32. We again divide by 2 to get 64. We divide by 2, 28, 256, 512, 1024, here, here, and then the last one is 16384, uh, which is almost there. So we need just another divide by 2 to get 1 hertz. So this whole IC will get us to about 2 hertz. And this is one of the reasons the early technology had this uh, available. So we want to pick a number that is a power 2 so it can be divided very uh, simply. In st 32 clock can be derived from number of sources like an internal oscillator, the external oscillator, or even from external system oscillator, also, although going through a divider. So this path is over here, so LSC, so low power uh, system external, so this is the external clock, uh, so this is the internal low power clock, and this is the external high frequency clock, which can be divided uh, maximum up to 32. And then this clock goes into the smooth calibration, which does not need to be used, and into two prescalers. So we have a 7-bit asynchronous counter over here and a 15-bit synchronous counter, which then feeds into the actual register for time and date. So with the combination of these two prescalers, the desired 1 Hz can be generated on the output. And it is advised from the datasheet that the first counter is to be kept as large as possible. So this is this thing over here, so this note over here. So the first asynchronous prescaler to be as high as possible to minimize power consumption. This is probably due to the optimization and the way that this first prescaler is created. And if we have a default value of 128, so divide this number by 128, we get the 256 hertz over here. And then if we set this prescaler to 256, we get the 1 hertz on the output. So the lower this frequency is, the more efficiently probably this prescaler will work and less power it will waste. As you might have seen, lots of real-time modules have a coin cell battery holder besides them. This is because the coin cell in this application is used as a backup power. It is very cheap, it holds charge for many years and it's used as soon as the main power supply is removed in order to keep the main oscillator and counters working even if the power is off or device has gone into the sleep mode. With st 32 this is implemented in form of the VBAT pin. So this is a dedicated pin on each of the microcontroller called VBAT. And the VBAT pin can have an input voltage of 1.65 to 3.6 volt and this is used to connect a simple battery over here. So this is where you would plug the console battery with probably a few deep coupling capacitors as well. So if the supply pin is active during the boot and it switched to VDD and only when the VDD is detected. So this is the boot process. And it also can switch back from VDD to VBAT internally over here as soon as the VDD is removed, so in order to preserve the RCT functionality and all the wake-up logic, backup register and backup RAM. And for this reason, RTC backup is not used, so this pin has to be tied to VDD. So if you're not using the battery, you have to tie this pin to the VDD common and give it a decoupling capacitor. And this is usually done when real-time clock is not used. Now we get to the juicy part, so what are the functionality, the additional functionality, not just the timekeeping that the peripheral can offer us. So we have two alarms called A and B, which you can set to trigger on a particular time. And this response can be either as an interrupt or a digital pin signal. And we're going to see this all over the place. We also can have an additional 16 bin down counter with a selectable prescaler called the wake up timer. So this can be either 2, 4, 8 or 16 prescaler from the main 32 kilohertz clock or from directly from the 1 hertz clock. This enables short and long timings to trigger external pins like reset from sleep or alarm or interrupt. This one is very useful to trigger accurate spaced interrupts for tasks like sampling from ADC in regular intervals. And if you go back to the scheme, this is this one over here, so wake up interrupt. It can source either this frequency or directly the 256 over here.
for its functionality and it's a 16-bit one so you can divide it really finely and then it can trigger the wake-up timer or even something like the RCC out as well. Another very useful one is a timestamp and it does exactly what it implies. It saves the current time and date into its own set of registers when an internal trigger on a GPIO is detected. A new event can also be triggered in form of an interrupt. Additionally, multiple signals from clock paths can be routed to external GPIO like the 256Hz pulse or the 512Hz or the 1Hz pulse uh, to the alternate function output. So this is really useful for some applications if you want to have a reference 1 hertz. And also, if needed, you can get the sub-second information obtained from the second divider and its prescaler. Because we know that that timer, so if you go back to it, this is the, the, this is the one I'm talking about, we know that this one is rolling over every one second because these uh, uh, prescaler values and the frequency are all known which means that we can calculate the milliseconds from current uh, setting of this prescaler. And this is just simply taking the current pre uh, counter value, dividing it by its prescaler, and then we can get a fraction of a second. And if we multiply that fraction of a second by a thousand, we can get milliseconds. And now a look into the functions that you're going to be using. You're mostly going to be using these two uh, structures over here the S time and S day, this is just the name that I gave them and it's also the name that is used all over the peripheral like uh, SLR, S time and S date. For the, uh, for the basic stuff you're gonna be using the set and get commands over here, let me get the white color. So set time, set date and get time and get date, you're gonna be using the instance of the RTC peripheral because it's the only one it's gonna be named HRTC. Then you're going to be using the pointers to this uh, structure. So in this case, you're going to be using a pointer to S time. And then a format. In this format is specified the 0 or 1, but it's uh, also a macro, either the bin or a binary code decimal, BCD. And if you choose bin, it transforms the internal numbers, so the seconds, minutes and hours, back to the actual uh, binary representation with which, which we can use to uh, later transform into strings and send them over UART. And it's same for the set data. As you can see, these functions look identical. Uh, for today's implementation, I'm going to be using the wake up to periodically wake up uh, an interrupt and send the time and date over UART. So I'm going to be using this function over here, the second one which is going to enable the wake up timer in interrupt mode. So not just enable it, but also enable the interrupts from this timer. For this particular peripheral, we're going to set up the counter appropriately. So it will trigger every one second and we will use the appropriate divider, which can be two, four, eight or 16. Uh, you can also use the deactivate, which I'm using on the beginning because how, when you enable the wake up timer from the, uh, cube configuration it automatically enables also the wake up timer so we're going to be disabling it the first thing and then we're going to configure everything else and in the end we're going to enable it for other peripherals like alarm and timestamp you also have similar uh, functions over here only have additional structures for alarm for setting the actual alarm time and you can trigger normally or with interrupt and this is basically it these are on the, in the end, here are all the interrupt functions. So these are the functions that are called by HAL when the interrupt for the real-time clock is uh, set. And in my case, in this today's presentation, I'm going to be using the wake-up timer event callback, which is a callback from the wake-up timer. And now we're in our cube configurator of the st 32 cube IDE. So I have a bare bones uh, project. So I just added the external oscillator. I added two GPIO outputs on the two LEDs in case I need them. And I also added the UART peripherals. Let's just look at that a bit. So I have simple asynchronous of the uh, 11, 5 to 100 bits per second, which is standard, 8 bits, no parity, and that's it. I don't have any interrupts on these, these are going to be used in uh, blocking mode. For the timers, this is where the RTC lies. So I'm going to be activating the clock source and the calendar, which enables the time and date. And then I'm also going to be enabling the wake up interrupt, so internal wake up. But this is just going to enable the wake up. 
and you have to actually tick by yourself the NVIC settings so the actual interrupt will be generated. In case of settings, as you can see, the dividers and prescalers are also already set up for us. So for in this case, asynchronous pre-divider is the maximum value possible, which is 128 minus one, because we're including the zero, uh, which leaves us with 256 Hertz. So we have our synchronous pre-divider value to a 255 in order to get one Hertz pulse. We say that we want to have data format in binary and all the other things, you can leave it at that. For the wake up clock, I'm also setting over here the clock by 16, but we are also gonna be modifying this later in our actual setup function. But you can choose different peripherals, just know that when you're gonna be choosing this one, it's gonna start it right away. Everything else is stock, so if you go to our main, everything I put is in main, so it's not confusing when you're gonna be looking at these files when I'm gonna provide you with the GitHub link. And if we go from the beginning, I defined a few macros. So as you can see, the HAL gave us the HRTC handle and the UART2 handle. And if we go to the main, we can see that the first thing I do is initialize a few variables. I have, as we mentioned before, the S time and S date. I have also a char array for the message for the UART. I have a size for the size of the message and the milliseconds, which are gonna be calculated separately. So the first thing I just send uh, the message hello, so I know the device is working. And this is just a standard thing, how to do it with UART in blocking mode. And I'm using the sprintf uh, function over here to generate the actual uh, char message. And then sprintf returns the length of the message with null termination. So this is what I pass into size, which is used to pass to the UART handler, so it knows what size of the message it has to send. Then I set the current time and date, and this is the time and date that I set up when I was working on this example. So in this case, weekday is a parameter of the structure that is used to detect a different day of the month. So this was the 22nd of the month, which month and year. And in this case, I have to know that the base year is 2000. So I have on the beginning over here, I made a year start, a, a static variable. This will also be a constant variable, but in case you want to increment it for the centuries, then it best to be a not constant variable, so you can also increment it. But it's a global year start, so this is what I'll be adding when we're gonna be sending our date. And we have our set date and set time functions over here. So after we set the hours and minutes, there's no point in setting, uh, setting the seconds, which are zero by default. We're just gonna set the set time and set date. With the RTC format win, we indicate in which form the time has been implemented. By default, all these numbers over here, which are in decimal, are gonna be uh, transformed into binary. So we have to tell the RTC set date and set time that we're giving it uh, time and date in binary form so it can uh, transform it back to the BCD in order to set the registers. Now when reading it's the same story. So in the while loop for the first example we're gonna have the get time and get date in order to read of uh, the clock and date. And again we're gonna be passing it the format bin but that's also RTC format BCD to tell it that it should return a uh, format in binary. For the milliseconds, this is the uh, equation that I told you before, the actual subseconds, which is the value of the uh, synchronous timer, is available also in the S time peripheral, and the second fraction is also available inside as well. So every time you set a get time command, it's gonna update this one, and of course this one the way it's set up. So this one will be 255, so you add the plus one back, and we divide the current count value by the prescaler and then multiply it also by a thousand to get milliseconds. And then just uh, cobble together the actual time and date. So in this case, I'm giving it date, month, year, plus the year start, because again, we only have zero to 99 years. And for the time as well, I'm adding the milliseconds at the end. And then I'm just toggling one LED. So I know that everything works every second. So this whole thing should happen every second according to the halt delay, which is based on the cystic timer, which is based on another timer 
which derives its clock from the system clock, so not the dedicated real-time clock. So hopefully you can see that the time and date is incrementing and the last part of the time is the milliseconds, but you can see that the milliseconds are changing over and over again. So uh, why is that? But we have a stable one millisecond. Well, that's because the hull delay and all these other functions uh, can extend the functionality of the actual delay. What means that all of this costs some time plus the actual hull delay. So it's more than one second of delay. So in constantly getting ahead of ourselves by one second and something else. And if we look at this a bit, it's around, let's see, the difference between these two is around 40, 30, 40 microseconds. So this is how long all of the overhead in the main loop is costing us. But let's test it up a little bit differently. As I said, if I enable wake up from the cube configurator, it's automatically enabled and the interrupt is started. So what I'm doing, the first thing is disabling the wake up timer. And this is after the RTC init, which is the one that enables it. So I disable the wake up timer. Then we configure the current time and date. And right in the end, I'm going to uncomment this one. So this is a set wake up timer. And we're gonna set the wake up divider by 16. And if we divide our RTC clock by 16, we get 2048 Hz. So we need a divide value of 2048 minus 1. So 2047. And this is gonna uh, set up the wake up timer and start it, which will uh, trigger an interrupt function. Let's remove this. And this is the uh, uh, event callback function. Because we have only one RTC peripheral, we don't need to check if that's the right one. I create a few statics so they don't need to be allocated at every execution, which saves a bit of time. The S time S date, another message, and the size for the actual size of the message. I get the time and date, calculate the millisecond just as before, and create time and date and send it over UART. Now let's download this onto the code. And then we will see what will happen to the milliseconds. I'm going to run it. Let's go back to Putty. And you can see it's running. And what we can see, the milliseconds are all identical. And I left it running for a really long time. And the milliseconds are identical. Why is that so? Because this interrupt function will only trigger exactly at one second based on the accuracy of the real-time clock. And when this does happen, it's going to first thing is going to read the time, then date, and then do a bunch of stuff which takes, which takes less than one second, obviously. And then when the next time it gets triggered, it's the same thing over again. So, I have a, so we have a predictable overhead how much time this is going to take. Therefore, the milliseconds are all the same. For a little experiment, I can put everything on pause. We can see it stopped and then run again we can see that it's exactly at the same value. Only in the middle over here, if you stop, I hope you can see that it's 238. This is because an interrupt was pending by the real-time clock, which in fact is running right now in the background, even though the CPU is stopped. So real-time clock is running, the wake-up timer is running, and it's pending interrupts on the NVIC. And right when I start it at a random time, the NVIC responds to the already pending interrupt request, which happens to be at the time of 625 milliseconds. That's why this timestamp, when you just start from the debug perspective, the milliseconds is a little bit off. But other than that, it's 996. And this value is exactly the 255 value of the prescaler timer. You can calculate it yourself, you will get this number. So 255 divided by 256 multiplied by 1000, you get 996, which means that this value is right when the uh, counter overflowed. So this is the explanation of real-time clock. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. I didn't go into all the functionality because I think that's enough for that. Uh, but I hope I gave you the courage so you can implement this peripheral, it's really not that hard, and then you just read the data sheet and get other alarms and other functionality to work, and we'll probably see in the next projects if I'm gonna use any of those functionality, so you can do it as well at home. So, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!